All right. Good morning, everyone. It is 11 a.m. here in Atlanta, Georgia, for our friends overseas and on the West Coast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just a few quick uh, reminders here. Uh, as with all of our webinars, they are all recorded uh, for your convenience, uh, for your review later. A link to this recording will be sent to you following this uh, presentation. Uh, a copy of the presentation will also be sent separately, so you have that uh, to uh, reference and access uh, on your own later. Uh, and then also for those of us joining us, uh, you'll also have access to our handout, which is our DNA unlocking guide uh, for discerning the personalities that, that we discuss as part of our platform. Uh, a few more things. We will keep everybody on mute so that there's not a lot of cross chatter. Uh, so it'll just be uh, ourselves presenting uh, with the slides in front of you. We will also, uh, we do encourage questions. Uh, so please use the question or the chat box uh, and, and we'll get back to you uh, as quickly as possible with uh, responses. There are also a number of poll questions that are peppered throughout the presentation just to make sure that we're all keeping up and, and, and on the same page with the information being, uh, being uh, presented. So that you know this is a new webinar for us. It, it is our normal Tuesday navigating financial personalities, but we've switched things up for 2018. So you're in for a real treat for those of us, for those of you that uh, that have attended multiple segments of this. This one is new. So uh, part of that is that although we've uh, uh, allotted 45 minutes for this presentation, we're hoping to only use up about a half hour. So get a bit of your uh, time back. Uh, uh, moving forward for our presentations and then again still open for questions and 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 future um, engagement as needed so without further ado let's uh, get things started uh, you've got uh, Leon Morales our chief relationship officer presenting today and then I am your chief marketing officer Trip Rockwell and we'll be uh, managing duties here and and getting you on your way so thank you very much thank you Trip. It's good to be back. Uh, we took a hiatus over December for the holiday. It typically is a low volume period for us, so we're excited to be back. We've got some great things to share with the group. And uh, as uh, Trip sort of teased out, we've got some new things that we wanted to talk about today. And we've also abbreviated the webinar just based on some feedback that we've got and keep it to 30 to 45 minutes. So that's our goal. <clears throat> and uh, But we never want to short circuit. If people have questions, we want to be able to answer those because it really benefits everyone on the call. And uh, so with that, we'll get started. Um, as Trip mentioned, I am the Chief Relationship Officer here at DNA Behavior. And uh, we also have Trip, who does our, our marketing. And then Lisa Travis is also on the call. And she does uh, sort of the consultant sales piece of what we do. So you may actually receive a follow-up from her after this presentation, seeing how the uh, experience was for you and anything that we can answer. Our objectives today are really refining around financial behavior. Um, last year and the year before, we spent a lot of time on really the 10 unique styles, so we'll just go through that uh, just as a reference because it's really important to the case study that we're going to present today on the financial behavior report. And uh, that's a new term that we're actually introducing on this webinar. It's actually the first time we've communicated it to the broader audience. The Financial Behavior Report is a one-page simple report because one of the things that we found over the years is that, uh, you know, we can go pretty deep into sort of the uh, insights for a client or an advisor, and we still keep the integrity of all of that, but one of the things that has really helped us in 2017 is simplifying the report into a one-page report that's really helping us and a lot of advisors be able to use the program much easier um, than getting tied up into a lot of insight terminology. So that's really the basis of that financial behavior report, and we're going to have a, uh, a report that we'll be able to, to demo on the screen. And then there's a, a very cool complimentary uh, financial behavior comparison report of the two individuals. So we'll spend a little time on that. So our plan uh, starting next week is to introduce that, what we call a starter package, which is this financial behavior report. And it's going to be a, a, uh, a $795 package, annual package that will be introduced 
Um, and it really contains just this financial behavior report with the comparison report. And the purpose of it is really to help um, sort of be able to move through the process in the planning process much easier with the client. So that's what we'll cover today. And again, we'll try to keep it pretty brief. But if there are questions, please let us know. Um, and then we have that unlocking guide that Trip referenced earlier. I would encourage you, if you haven't downloaded that before, to actually download that because it's got a lot of great information and it leverages this financial behavior report quite a bit. So just to reorient you on sort of the behavioral finance approach that we talk about quite a bit here at DNA Behavior, um, the term 93.6 of financial planning is behavioral managing yourself or your clients. It's a research paper that Mir Statman did back in 2000. Uh, it's, you know, in the work that I've done here at DNA Behavior for the last six years, it really does point to really knowing sort of an individual and what their needs would be to sort of build the appropriate and suitable plan for them that really meets sort of FINRA sort of guidelines or, you know, meets, meets the compliance sort of integrity of the firm. And we do know that, you know, even if you have a husband and a wife, they might react very differently to the same event that's going on. Or if you have two clients, which you might even consider that it's a good event that's going on, you may have a client that's actually a little skeptical or a little bit reserved that, you know, it's going to be an issue for them. So even though it's the same market event, um, you know, you'll, they'll hear things in the media that might trigger some responses and then you have to manage that. And part of what we talk about with financial DNA is these three components, the advisor client communication, which we consider to be very critical to sort of the, um, not only the onboarding, but the client relationship and sort of the fostering and developing of the, the relationship and then building the plan. And then knowing the financial risk, the risk profile and behavioral biases of the client is pretty important to know as you're building the plan. And then actually, after you build a plan, it's sort of building the goals, knowing how that client is going to actually react or sort of follow through on the spending pattern or the behaviors that you've agreed to. That all makes up the financial behavior or the financial personality of the client, and we call that financial DNA. So we do have a poll question on the screen here. Uh, you can read that, and then it'll present itself. So basically, just getting into things, uh, are you currently using a behavioral finance tool? And uh, just like to get a quick temperature check on where everyone stands here. And then uh, just a quick cross section and share those results. So a uh, good number of you. I understand some of you that are not might have an off cuff, you know, kind of a way of measuring up your clients and prospects as they come through the door and trying to work your way through that portfolio building and, and, and who needs what attention when. So completely understand that. Great. Thank you. And uh, as Trip mentioned, a lot of times you might have sort of an internal process that you use in the firm, um, and it could be considered a behavioral finance sort of solution. But, you know, we always believe that once you uh, use a tool like financial DNA, you really know the client much deeper and be able to sort of meet the needs of them and their partner, you know, spouse, and even the family members. In 2015, Vanguard did this great study on behavioral uh, behavioral management, and it really speaks to the value proposition of your work as an advisor working with a client that, um, in, in the references, 150 basis points per year of additional value to that portfolio when they use sort of behavioral finance or behavioral approach or coaching approach to helping them build the, the plan. And if you think about it, it really does make sense because if you're actually investing and you have no one else giving you some inputs or some advice or guidance, you might actually make sort of behavioral finance mistake based on sort of your own behavior. And so if you have that other individual to keep you in check, that's really what that speaks to um, for the advisor. And then it does build firm value because if a uh, client's actually meeting and exceeding goals, uh, you know, they're more likely to refer your firm or you as an advisor to their uh, their network and a much larger share of the wallet. Then we're now we're getting into the specifics of sort of what financial DNA is. It's a 46 question discovery. It's listed here on the right hand side. It's a discovery that takes about 10 to 12 minutes to complete. It's a forced choice uh, assessment or questionnaire. 
And what it does, and indicated here by this iceberg slide, is that it sort of measures the level one behavior that uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote about in uh, Fast and Thinking uh, Slow. It's the book that he won the Nobel Prize back in 2002. But this natural and instinctive behavior is important to know because it's sort of a fallback position. Every one of us has a natural and instinctive behavior that we might recognize. It's pretty in, in tune with who we are. Or we might actually have some pretty sophisticated learned behavior that we learn through our jobs and experience. But we always, in times of pressure or sort of, uh, you know, just a, it's native to us, fall back to this natural behavior. So that's the starting point that we talk about with financial DNA because it's very important to, to know. There are other things that can measure the learned behavior, but you really want to know when you're building the portfolio, the baseline for that client, where they're going to react to risk, to volatility in the market. Because if you don't, you might actually be building a plan that, uh, you know, they say they want more risk, but they're not. Re it's not really suitable for them. So it's just important to know what that natural behavior is. And we do this, um, it's sort of a way to really help uh, an advisor or uh, an individual using the system on how to identify sort of some of those behaviors. And we start out with, after everybody completes financial DNA, it'll actually plot them sort of in this chart here, and there are 10 of them. Um, five of them over here on the left-hand side are what we call very sort of results-focused profiles. And then the ones over here on the right are more uh, relational. But we all have elements of sort of results and relationships in our profile. We just do naturally. But it really helps to understand the characteristics that is in each one of these 10 profiles. For instance, here on this slide, you can see here in this quadrant, being with initiator, strategists, and influencers, that they take a more consolidated view. They typically have an overtrading sort of propensity. They have optimism bias and risk-taking in their profile. That's just a natural sort of instinct in these profiles. It's not, the, the intensity of it probably will vary by person by person, but you'll see some of these behaviors, these behavioral biases sort of inherent in that. On the flip side, over here with relationship builders, facilitators, and some adapters, they have these behavioral biases, risk aversion, loss aversion, fear of regret, and disposition effect. They might get a little bit more nervous when the market's going up too fast. They may actually think that it's going to go down. There's sort of a natural instinct to do that. So this gives you an idea of how these behavioral biases sort of play into these 10 profiles. So if you've actually taken financial DNA, you'd probably know uh, your two top behavioral factors and behavioral biases as part of that. And if you don't know or if you haven't taken the financial DNA assessment or questionnaire, there will be an opportunity to do that at the end of this. Um, and I encourage you to do that, to learn more sort of about your own sort of investing uh, biases. And then uh, we do a lot of discussion or presentations on, on this particular topic around behavioral responses that drive decision making. Because we do know that with financial personality, which is sort of the financial DNA, sort of uh, part of what I've talked about earlier, plus money divided by emotions really does trigger these behavioral responses. And it doesn't matter what somebody has $100 or, you know, a billion dollars. The reaction that people will have is sort of uh, natural and instinctive. You know, they actually might uh, uh, handle decision-making sort of differently based on sort of that, the comfort level of having a lot of money. But you will see some of the same characteristics of those behavioral biases on that. That's why it's important to know that because if you do know it as an advisor, that 93.6% of behavioral management becomes much easier to learn how to actually work with that client. Because if you think about it, we're more naturally wired to think about how, how we think. So when you're approaching a client, you're using it through your own lens, not necessarily their lens. That's what financial DNA really does help to be able to understand is how do you actually communicate with that client sort of on a way that uh, meets their need and being able to sort of build a plan that's going to be suitable for them. And this is an example of what we call the forced choice process, discovery process or questionnaire. Um, and it's a, you pick one most and one least likely 
and it uh, takes you through a screen and it's sort of guided. It's a pretty simple uh, questionnaire and it's by design. Every keyword is, is very important to the process to be able to, uh, to see what that natural and instinctive behavior is to map the 10 uh, where that individual is going to, to end up on that quadrant and then measure their behavioral biases. And, and as you see here, none of these word choices, these options have anything to do with finance. So you're not going to see a behavioral bias. You're not going to see a risk question in here. And that's part of the, the beauty of the platform being forced choices is that it's completely unbiased in how it collects the data, the algorithm that, that figures out what those personality types are uh, as, as we build that profile on the individual. So, you know, that, that is the crux of, of, of how accurate uh, uh, our performance is uh, in these profiles. Thank you, Tripp. That's good. Also, um, after you've completed the 46 questions, as Tripp mentioned, the uh, simplicity of that part of it, it'll actually prompt the individual to go to this uh, unique style video. It gives you these five elements here on uh, sort of how an individual um, sees sort of their risk and how they actually approach investing with the advisor. Um, so these five elements are really part of that financial behavior report that I've mentioned earlier. So it's a it's a client dashboard that the client would receive at the end of their discovery process. And then there's a great video here um, that will actually describe in words in a video format um, that particular uh, profile type. So it's a, sort of an end-to-end -end process. Um, that we try to make it. It's educational in nature because we really want to make sure the end user client understands sort of what their financial DNA is. So when they go to the advisor, they actually have an education element to it already. So here is uh, what we call a financial behavior report. And it's, uh, again, it's a, a newly launched report and it'll be part of a report set uh, package that we'll be marketing starting next week. Uh, but it will show these five elements that I mentioned before. So the risk behavior. So we now know we can measure sort of the risk for the individual. It shows the financial relationship management that the client would have to the advisor, whether they will uh, enable the advisor to take a little bit more control or they want to take control. Financial planning management, you know, whether they're a saver or they're following budgets. Their wealth building motivation. Um, is, is included in there, you know, how, how likely are they when they're building wealth to, to, to meet that plan. And then the final one is financial emotional intelligence. And it scores it from a score of, of very low to, you know, very high. In this particular case, other than the financial relationship management, this case study here for Chris Coddington, he's less likely to uh, relinquish control of his decision making to the advisor. Everything else he scores pretty high. But the format of this report, and it might be a little tough to read, but when you do get the, uh, the PDF, you can sort of probe down a little bit deeper. Um, it shows the two top behavioral factor or biases of this individual. In Chris Coddington's example, he is what we call um, an um, optimism bias and overconfident. So that can be problematic. You might have to actually taper his expectations down if he's really bullish on something. Um, it shows here the best way to adopt a plan to actually, when you're working with Chris, to help him adopt his plan. These are the key points you'd want him to remember. And then it shows here, this is tough to read, but he's a strategist. And then it shows here a lot of great information for the advisor and for the client to understand uh, the importance of the financial behavior. So all of these are what we call a financial behavior report. And uh, it's the... It's the report that uh, has really gotten a lot of good feedback around the simplicity of it. Um, and it doesn't get too tied up into language with you, or, you know, not knowing how to explain it to the client. And there's a, a complimentary document, that unlocking guide, which you really can help understand sort of the behaviors of the client. So uh, if uh, anybody wants to complete that uh, questionnaire and receive their own uh, financial behavior report, you know, we'll make sure that's available for you. If you've already completed the profile, um, after we send this out, Lisa Travis can actually run that report for you um, and send that to you if uh, you're already registered in the system.
The guidelines for using the financial behavior report, remember it measures that normal hardwired behavior that we've talked about. We do not uh, identify sort of mental health. That's not really the advisor's role or DNA behaviors. Um, the behavioral traits do remain stable over time, so the client would only have to take a uh, financial DNA questionnaire one time. Um, there are no good or bad styles. I mentioned the 10 profile types, uh, whether you're relational, more relational, or you're more results-focused. It's just how you're wired, and the key to it is really understanding how to use that information for a better sort of clarity in decision-making. And we should remember that even if you're the advisor, that um, you having an exact match to your client would probably be a 0.08%. Um, so that's, uh, you know, pretty important to know that you would really have to flex sort of your style in any given situation with most clients. Um, and no decision should be made solely on the report. It's another dimension of the client experience. Um, and we do see that great advisors come from all 10 profile types, so there's no one that works better than the other, but once they have sort of the behaviorally smart sort of training around this, it can uh, lead to like great results. And then the behavioral factor measurements are very neutral to gender, age, uh, generational, and birth order. So those are some great things to remember when you're actually doing a debrief of the financial behavior report or if you're doing an interpretation. Another poll question. All right, so do you understand how behavioral biases impact investor and advisor decision-making? Uh, you know, it's very dependent on um, both styles being overlaid one another and, and what level of adaption you need to uh, acquire in order to maintain that fit. So um, pretty good response here, and we're all coming up on the same <laughs> pretty 100%. So, Leon, you're doing Wonderful. very well keeping everybody <laughs> All right. on path. I think That's the key great. was Chris Coddington's uh, overconfidence bias, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate that. Um, and just as a point of reference, we do measure 16 different behavioral biases. So when somebody completes that 46 question, their two behavioral biases might be very different than their spouse. So it's probably important to know that. Um, and using behavioral intelligence, we do know, and this is a stat that came out a number of years ago, that 51% of the clients really leave their advisors because they don't really understand their goals and objectives. And if you're the most rational advisor and you have a very relational client, you, you, the terminology that you use can be pretty important because they don't even really like the name goals. They sort of like to know that it's going to be a lifestyle, how they're going to actually meet the needs of their family. And engaging with each partner can be very sort of interesting because we do see that 70% of couples are opposites. So you can do yourself a huge favor and advantage by knowing sort of the behavioral styles of each one of those clients, leading to better meetings, navigating those couple differences really to have a much, you know, as you're building the plan for the couple that sort of meets their need. And then creating sort of that customized commitment to their financial plan based on their, their terms. So it's a lot, of, a lot of power there with that information, that behavior report. And then uh, this is a client couple report. So it basically takes the, both of their financial behavior reports and then matches the two of them. And you can see here that Chris is a strategist who's got that very high risk behavior, low financial relationship management. So we saw that on the previous report. Or his wife, Helen, is an engager is very high emotional financial intelligence, low financial relationship management as well. So your task would really be, how do you actually navigate this couple to build a plan? Because he's at a 98% on uh, risk. She's 66. So you got to build that suitable plan that meets the family need. Um, and then when it comes to actually uh, uh, deferring to the advisor, neither one of them are really that interested. You know, Helen might be a little bit easier to, to work with, but Chris, you're going to really have to, to, to meet his need sort of very quick responses as we saw in that last report. Um, they both are reasonably good at following and saving. Um, they're pretty good at goals. I would imagine Chris is going to be the driver in that. And then when it comes to their financial emotional intelligence, they both have a pretty high score. So that's, that's really good information to know, and it's included in that financial behavior report set. So that comparison report gives you a lot of great information to work with your clients. And then one of the big changes we're making into our packages in 2018 
is we're including market mood in each one of our packages, whether it's the starter package, whether it's the introductory package, or whether it's the uh, financial uh, behavior or the behavioral finance package. Each of those will have market mood. As I mentioned earlier at the very start, that in the same market event, you may have clients that react very differently to an event. And this dashboard really gives you some key information, sort of quick. When you log into the system, it gives you some great information to be able to work with your clients. It's a huge added benefit to the packages, along with the uh, that financial behavior report. So gives the advisor some great information. This actual index for market mood is tied to S&P 500, as indicated here. But if you actually work with a different sort of index, you can actually use the input button to, to go up or down based on sort of that individual index. So there's a lot of great information, and the, and the keywords will change, or that messaging will change based on that volatility. Great bonus for market mood. We're pretty excited about that launch. Another poll question here. So can you as an advisor use behavioral finance to understand client personalities and help them achieve their goals? Basically the goal of our platform and of our program today. So uh, based on that, we'll uh, see where the crowd stands at this point. And again, back <laughs> wow. a thousand there, Leon, you're doing Maybe fantastic. Maybe our simplicity has really uh, uh, been received well. That's great. Excellent. So that really is uh, the focus. We did say we wanted to keep it to 30 minutes, but we're always uh, open. I know Tripp's been monitoring the, uh, the chat box and answering questions there, but if you do have one that sort of benefits the group, we're certainly always welcome to entertain those. We do have our next featured webinar scheduled for uh, Tuesday, January 30th at 11. The link is there. It's really around uh, using sort of the uh, the business DNA program, which is the same questionnaire, that same 46 question that uh, we call natural behavior. It powers both financial DNA and business DNA, but using it with hiring, building a successful team, and client engagement. You know, those are the, some things that are pretty important with advisory and advisory teams. Um, we're going to keep it to the 45 minutes with content around 30 minutes. Um, keep it pretty easy. Keep it sort of on a case study um, basis because that always works pretty well. And then um, I think one of the uh, – we have the, just the last page around taking the discovery, um, which you can actually take it using financialdna.com. And there's take a trial button that's on the website. So just you can – uh, find that link there, and if you have completed, if it gives you a message, you know, you're already registered in the system, send uh, send one of us an email, and we can make sure that it gets directed, and uh, you get the financial behavior report. Because it's important to note that for those that are interested in taking the business DNA side, you don't have to take the questionnaire again. It's Again, it's you only have to take it that one time. It's just a different algorithm and a different output that provides that report, and we're happy to provide that business side that business level report uh, for you and your clients as 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 a as a trial uh, opportunity uh, just to see how it all shakes out for you. Great, and we constantly keep our blog site uh, uh, up to date, so you can find any relevant topics around behavioral finance. We've got a great podcast series; they're about 17, 18 minutes. Got a lot of great feedback on that, and then the resource center there. Uh, additional resources. You can find us on LinkedIn, on Financial Personality Insights, and Twitter. Um, and if there are no questions that uh, have an Just some basic ones uh, that our white papers answer. People want to know where the Mir Statman stats come from. And, and of course, then the Nathaniel... Um, um, Daniel Carmen. Daniel Carmen, sorry. Yeah, and, and his Nobel pieces. So those, those are readily available, and, and we'll send the links out to those yeah, in question. Okay, so thank great. you. Excellent. Thank you for the questions. We always appreciate that. And if you have some suggestions on the format, what you'd like to see, because we do host this webinar every Tuesday, we alternate it between 1 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 every other month, just so we can capture some uh, West Coast individuals. And then we have some European clients that uh, log in and actually South America. So we really try to, to meet the need of the audience. Um, and I think there will be a short survey that will go out right after you complete this uh, webinar, 
we really listen and look at that feedback it's important to us we really try to stay connected with the audience so uh, anything that we can do to make it better and easier we try to do that and i mentioned you will be getting a message from lisa travis regarding this presentation uh, sometime later today and if nothing else just the last just for additional resources there is an appendix to this uh presentation to this deck and when you get the copy of the recording We'll also send out a, a hard copy, basically a PDF, of the presentation so that those additional uh, resources are, are um, made available to you. Very good. With that, we hope to hear you on a future webinar, uh, maybe the one on the 30th, and uh, if not, next month. And thank you again. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.